Okay, we're going to go ahead and start and then I'll just let people in, uh, which is what I'm doing right now. Um, also, uh, sorry, can you also, Barbara, let people in? Okay, I'm just muting people. I'm muting everyone because we're getting a lot of ambient noise right now otherwise. So let me introduce Selena Adams. Some of you uh, may have already seen her when she came in and she presented her Nesting Dolls book, which was a wonderful book. Today, she's talking about a brand new book um, that I will also say is doing very well on Amazon. When I looked on Amazon, it's doing very nicely, which is, as an old publishing person, I, that's always a good indicator for me. Um, but the name of this book is My Mother's Secret, a novel of the Jewish autonomous region. I would, I just ordered my copy, because it looks really good. Um, so obviously, again, as an old publishing person, I encourage all of you to buy the book in whatever format you like to read a book or to get it from your, um, order it from your library. So um, I'm now gonna turn it over to Alina so that you can start talking. Thank you so much. And it's not just available on Amazon, it's at Barnes and Noble, it's at Target, it's at Books A Million, it's at the actual publisher. So thank you so much for that, uh, for that publishing introduction, Margie. Um, as Margie said, my name is Alina Adams. Well, actually, it's Alina Siverinovsky. Actually, it's Alina Genrichovna Siverinovskaya is the name that I was born with. I was born in Odessa. At the time, it was the USSR. Currently, it's Ukraine. Ukraine is an area about which people have been hearing a lot more over the past year than they ever had. My uh, my older son, who's a public policy major, said, it's amazing how people have all these opinions about a country they couldn't even find on a map a year ago. So that's where I was born. I was born in Odessa, Ukraine. And then I immigrated with my parents initially to San Francisco, California in the late 1970s, which was actually one of the biggest waves of immigration. It peaked in 1979, and then it went back down again until after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So I grew up partially in the Soviet Union, partially in the United States, and I knew I wanted to be a writer from the time that I was a small child. And what's the piece of advice that writers are always given? Writers are always told, write what you know. So what did I know? I knew about being a Soviet immigrant. I knew about the Soviet Union. I wrote what I knew. And this was back in the day, against Margie mentioned her publishing day. This was back in the days before email. So you would need to print out your manuscript. I don't know if people remember dot matrix printers, those uh, printers that had the paper that you ripped on the side and they went bzz, bzz, bzz. And if your paper got stuck, you could print an entire book on one line. So you had to stand there staring at it. So this was back in the days where you had to print out your manuscript, your 300 word manuscript, put it in an envelope, put in a self-addressed stamped envelope because you had to pay them to reject you. Back in the day, send it to the publisher and then wait for feedback. And all the feedback that I got was nobody cares, Russia doesn't sell, this is not a topic of interest to readers. Then in 1994, I got a call from an editor at Avon Books, and she said to me the usual thing, Russia doesn't sell, nobody cares, but you can clearly write. And she said, I bind you authors in the genre of Regency romance. Would you like to try writing a Regency romance? And I said, sure. And then I hung up the phone and I said, uh, what's a Regency romance? Now, if it were now, I would know because Bridgerton is like the hottest thing on Amazon. Um, Regency Romance, it's Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice, Sense and Sensibility, books written during the time in Regency England between 1811 and 1820. So write what you know. What do I know about Regency England? Nothing. What do I know about Jews? I know about Jews. So what did I do? I snuck some Jews into Regency England. Now, it's historically accurate. If you look up the time, there was a handful of Jews who were very wealthy, or at least wealthy enough that they were allowed into, uh, I think somebody has unmuted themselves. Um, please mute yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, that they were wealthy enough that they were allowed into high English society. So I snuck some Jews 
into my book that became known as The Fictitious Marquis. It came out in 1994 from Avon Books. And then, you know, I went on with my life. And then about three years ago, I was Googling my name, which is a perfectly normal thing to do. And it turned out that the Romance Writers of America, which is the guild that um, sort of over, oversees all romance writing in America, had named the fictitious marquee the first own voices Jewish historical. What that meant was it was the first historical novel about Jews written by a Jewish author. Now, this kind of stunned me because this was in 1994, not 1894, not 1944. Had it really not happened that a Jewish author had written a Regency romance featuring Jewish characters? Now, the fact is Julia Quinn, who writes Bridgerton, she is Jewish herself, but she doesn't have Jewish characters in her book. And Georgette Heyer, who is considered sort of the godmother of Regency romance, um, wasn't Jewish, was actually kind of famously anti-Semitic, but did have Jewish characters in her books. So it wasn't until 1994 that I accidentally, as a friend of mine said the other day, you're a trendsetter. I said, I'm an accidental trendsetter. It never crossed my mind that in 1994, a Jewish author had never put Jewish characters into a Regency romance. So it's blowing my mind to this day. But because of that, the book was re-released, The Fictitious Marquis, also available on Amazon, but that was my first book and the one that I snuck Jews into. So after that, I wrote other Regency romances. I wrote contemporary romances. I wrote a series of figure skating murder mysteries because I had worked for ABC Sports in their figure skating department. I wrote tie-in books for two soap operas, As the World Turns and Guiding Light, because I also worked for those shows. And the whole time I kept trying to sell books that had a theme with Jews, uh, Russian Jews in them. But the feedback was always, remember, Russia doesn't sell, nobody cares. And then about four years ago, I was having lunch with my agent and she said to me, you know, Russia is really hot right now. And I said, oh, I can't imagine why. What could possibly be going on in the world that's making Russia so hot right now? So that led to the publication of my historical fiction novel, The Nesting Dolls. The Nesting Dolls came out in July of 2020. Um, when people ask about releasing a book in the middle of a pandemic, I don't exactly recommend it. Although I must say, it's actually been really nice doing these kind of virtual visits. I was able to visit places I never would have been able to visit before. So, you know, I've been accused of toxic positivity, but I always look on the bright side of everything. So that was kind of fun. Now, The Nesting Dolls, that's the book that came out in July of 2020, took place in three different time periods. The first one was in 1930s Odessa, which I said I was born in Odessa, and so were my parents, and so were my grandparents, um, and then in Siberia, because things did not go well. And then it took place in the 1970s in Odessa, which was actually the era when my parents and I lived there. And then it took place in present-day Brighton Beach, Brooklyn. So it was three generations of a Jewish family. And the feedback that I received from people was, wow, we have read so much historical fiction and we had no idea what was going on in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. You're talking about Stalin's purges and the great terror and all of the privation. So that was definitely the favorite part, which is why when it came time to writing my next book, the bulk of it actually takes place in the 30s and 40s because that was the time period when people said they were most interested in. But here's also something that's interesting. When I was doing these talks for the nesting dolls and I was talking to people all over the US in England in Israel, Canada, and at the end of my presentation about the nesting dolls, I would ask people a question. I would say, what was the first independent Jewish state of the 20th century. So now I'm actually putting this question to you and you can either put the answer in the chat box or you can just unmute yourself and speak up. What was the first independent Jewish state of the 20th century? Anybody? Come on, this is interactive. Anyone? Anyone? Okay, I'm gonna tell you. The first independent Jewish state 
of the 20th century was not the state of Israel, which was established in 1948. It was actually the state of Birabajan, which was located on the border between Russia and China. That was the first independent Jewish state of the 20th century. Now, why was it the first independent Jewish state of the 20th century? A couple of things. First of all, at that point in the 1920s, which is where we're going to start, Zionism is illegal in the Soviet Union because it's considered a nationalistic movement and nationalistic movements are illegal. But the Soviet Union had a little tiny problem. After the revolution of 1918, it was decreed that all Soviet citizens were equal. There was no more racism. There was no more anti-Semitism. There was no more any of those petty bourgeois concerns that they had had under the Tsars. Now that the Soviets were in charge, everyone was equal and peace reigned throughout the land. Except there was a little problem. The fact is the Jewish citizens, it was, it was twofold. First, some of the Jews that lived in the shtetls, what you think of when you think of the old pale of settlement in the Soviet Union, they lived in the shtetls. A lot of them came into the city looking for work. So they were competing with people who used to live there. And under communism, they had offered um, land to people, not to be privately owned, but to be communally shared. That's where they use communal farms. And as it turned out, even though the Soviet Union had repeatedly said there is no more racism, there is no more anti-Semitism in the USSR, guess what? The ethnic Russians, the ethnic Ukrainians, the people whose land had now been taken over were not happy to see Jews being given land. They were much happier when Jews had no land and lived in their shtetls. So this led to an uptick in anti-Semitic violence. I mean, we have the pogroms prior to the Soviets, but the Soviets would like you to believe nothing negative happened afterwards. That is not true. You still had quite a bit of anti-Jewish violence. So they decided that the way to solve this problem would be to take the Jews and move them somewhere else. That way they weren't in people's faces and they weren't annoying them with their Jewishness and that way they could keep down anti-Jewish violence. So in 1926, I have some notes here. I'm not gonna pretend that I have all this memorized, but in 1926, they, it was stated that Jewish agricultural settlement has called forth a sharply heightened anti-Jewish mood. So in order to not have a heightened anti-Jewish mood, it was decided by a group called the Committee for the Settlement of Toiling Jews on Land. They were going to turn Jews into farmers and into workers. OZET is the Russian acronym. They were offered the area that would become known as Birabajan. It's actually because it's between two rivers, the Biro River and the Bajan River. So they were offered this piece of land to have their own Jewish homeland. And they wrote an 80 page report explaining why this land would be unsatisfactory. They said there were gadflies, mosquitoes, midges. Um, these um, insects were constantly biting people. They were constantly biting animals. Um, and people had to wear netting to go outside because the land was so swampy that it was difficult to farm with all of these insects. They also pointed out that the land at the moment was occupied by Cossacks and ethnic Koreans who actually owned most of the land or at least had owned it at some point before the Soviets came in. And also because they were on the border with China, there were poppy fields that were in dispute. So you periodically have Chinese gangsters coming over either from China or other areas to fight people for their land. So these were the reasons why the Committee for the Settlement of Toiling Jews on Land said Birabajan would not be acceptable to them as a new independent Jewish homeland, to which point the government said, okay, but that's what you're getting anyway, so go. It wasn't even a take it or leave it, it was just go. So there was a train station called Tichanya, which means the quiet one, which was sort of the only centralized point around which they could start building this settlement. And that's where people went. In April of 1928, 504 families and 150 single people arrived. By May, two thirds of them are gone. 
That's because the living conditions were not even primitive. They were basically non-existent. People were literally living in holes in the ground. Zimlianka, it's a word. It's kind of like, it, it's not even... Um, uh, a dugout. It's more like you dig, you dig a hole and people live there. You have the weather. This is Siberia. It's Southern Siberia. It's not Northern Siberia. So it's not as cold, but it gets cold. It's pretty raining. And remember the insects, the ones that bite you to death. So we have 504 families and 150 singles arrive in April in 1928 and two thirds of them leave in May. That is not a great look for the area so afterwards they actually make it illegal for people to leave once you arrive you have to stay so in the summer of 1928 they established Bürofeld, which is the first jewish collective in the east and here's a really interesting historical fact so we all know that historically there were jewish villages and jewish settlements that were turned into russian settlements russian villages russian communal farms ukrainian communal farms the city of amerzut is the very first and only historical incident of a Russian village being turned into a Jewish settlement. It had gone a lot the other way, but it had never gone that way. So that is, you have your first settlement where it's actually Jews have moved in enough numbers that they can turn a Russian city into a Jewish city. So the area is administered by ECOR, which is a joint administration of Soviet and American Jewish authorities. And this is actually something really important, is that initially most of the money for this settlement was raised in America. I mean, it was raised partially in the West, but it was also raised in America because American Jews were very enthusiastic about this. American Jews held um, fundraising concerts where people like Paul Robeson would sing. They had posters that were designed by great American Jewish artists. They wanted to make this a success. So from the beginning, here we are, we're in the Soviet Union. We're on the border between Russia and China. And who's funding most of this? American money. Um, which did lead to a little bit of tension, actually quite a bit of tension, in that it was supposed to be all good socialist communist values, and the Americans came in, and the Americans said, well, we're the ones who are funding this, so you should do it our way, which, when you think about it, it's super hysterical. You have these American socialists coming in and saying, well, we should be in charge because we're providing the money. Anyone who understands the movement sees how really comical it is. So by 1932, you have these settlements and um, all the crops are flooded and all the animals die. That's one of their, uh, their first crops. Meanwhile, at the same time, a German writer by the name of Bergelson wrote an essay praising the Rabajan, talking about how rich and fertile the farmland was, how wonderful the crops were, how fish was practically jumping out of the lake into nests. When I was... Um, researching My Mother's Secret, a novel of the Jewish Autonomous Region, my mother and I found a 1936 propaganda movie that was made in the Soviet Union. It was made in a combination of Russian and Yiddish, and it was supposed to be showing people how wonderful it was so that people would voluntarily immigrate there. And one of the big scenes is there's so much fish that they're practically jumping out of the water into the nets, and there's fields full of food with farm machinery, which, by the way, most people in Birabajan did not have, because even though they were promised farm machinery, it didn't arrive on time. And so you see happy workers, they're singing, they're working, everyone is equal, everything is great. That's the movie. It's called Seekers of Happiness. It's actually available on YouTube. It is fabulous. You should look it up. But so 1936, the year that this movie comes out, explaining how wonderful everything is in Birabajan, all their crops are flooded and all their animals die. So that's reality, but that doesn't stop the people writing propaganda, especially people from other countries. As I mentioned, Bergelson was German. So he basically wrote about how wonderful the Ravajan was without actually being there, but he kept telling people how wonderful it was and that they should come. So by this point, people are no longer living at holes in the ground. They're living in barracks, which are like two-story, if you can imagine, really long two-story buildings that are basically dorms, but there's no running water. 
There's no electricity. There's one room per family. So everybody's stuffed into one room where there's holes in the wall and the rain is coming in and the soot is coming in. Um, there's no windows, but don't worry about it. Fresh air is coming in because there's cracks in the walls. And one of the other things is because there were so many insects, people are constantly burning fires to keep the insects away. So the smoke and the soot that's coming in too through the holes in the walls. But don't worry, the movie says everything is great. Now, there was a five-year plan that said three-fourths of the people who were living in Barabajan would end up working in industry, which is in factories, which is another point of contention because the Soviet communists believe that everyone should work the land and it should all be about being peasants and tilling the soil. In fact, they say the biggest problem with Jews is they don't have a connection to the land. They don't have a connection to the soil. That's why Jews are so obsessed with money. But once we'll break them of the habit of Jews being obsessed with money and we'll get them working as farmers, everything will be fine. Meanwhile, the American delegation, remember the one who's paying with money, they're saying, well, the only way that we will ever be self-sustaining is if we create factories and we build products. As one of them said, you know, Soviets are so used to shoddy goods because you had so little choice. You had to take what was made. So, but they said even Soviets will eventually be tired of shoddy goods. So if we here in Barabajan can make useful products for our factories, we'll actually be able to be self-sustaining, which again was such um, was so unappealing to those who felt you should be working the land and they were tired of these Americans coming in and sort of stealing their thunder and telling them how they were going to do it. Um, meanwhile, in 1934, they were just skipping through the years now, in 1934, the Communist Party granted Barabajan status as a Jewish autonomous region. So remember what I asked in the beginning, what was the first Jewish autonomous state of the 20th century? It wasn't Israel in 1948. It was Birabajan in 1934. And in fact, the declaration read in Russian, but I'll read you the English version of it. For the first time in the history of Jewish people, its burning desire for a homeland, for the achievement of its own national statehood has been fulfilled. And who has it been fulfilled by? It has been fulfilled by Joseph Stalin, that great friend of the Jews, who in the 1930s, as Jews are being sent to Barabajan, um, is starting the first of his purges, which is basically he decides that anyone who he ever thought might not have liked him is uh, going to be deported to Siberia. Whether they confess or they don't confess, it's irrelevant. They already have a confession for them to sign. Some people signed confessions in a language they didn't even speak. That, again, wasn't relative, uh, relevant. Stalin comes up with the doctor's plot, which is the theory that Jewish doctors are deliberately trying to poison good Russian citizens, which point many, many Jewish doctors are deported. So while all this is going on in the primary part of Russia, in Barabajan, we have Jews fleeing, trying to avoid that. So we have 1936, we have the settlement. As you know, here's where history is coming along. So um, in, the, in February of 1936, Barabajan receives a visit from Lazar Kaganovich, who at that point was known as the most powerful Jew in the Soviet Union. Um, somebody just came in, please meet yourself. Thank you so much. So officially, Lazar Kaganovich is the secretary of the Central Committee, Commissar of Communications. But after his name, anything that you read, it also says most powerful Jew in the USSR. You would have thought that was part of his name or at least part of his title. So La Lazar Kaganovich comes and he visits Birabidjan, and he praises the cooking of his hosts who are part of the local village Soviet. He also agrees this is wonderful. Isn't it terrific? The Jews finally have their own homeland. And then he goes home. So this is February of 1936, okay? In August of 1936, Lazar Kaganovich, the most powerful Jew in the Soviet Union, is, according to Stalin, or at least the people who write his press releases, revealed to be unmasked as untrustworthy, counter-revolutionary, and bourgeois nationalist. He who is conspiring to create a murderous Bundist Nazi fascist organization. 
These are all things that between he apparently did between February of 1936 and August of 1936. So because he had visited local party leaders in Barabajan, the assumption is now that they too are part of this anti-Stalinist conspiracy. So the party head is removed. The foreign collectives, remember I mentioned there were American collectives there, um, are they are all disbanded. Also, people who came from outside of the Soviet Union had to pay 2,000 US dollars for the privilege of being allowed to work on this communal farm and have all of their belongings taken away from them and their passports. That's the other thing. Americans who um, immigrated to the Soviet Union had their passports taken away, which means if they wanted to go back to America, it was too bad. So um, also ethnic Koreans were deported because the assumption was, well, World War II is around the corner. They don't know that yet, but they at least know that J Japan is gearing up. So they assume that all Koreans are spies for Japan and they deport the ethnic Koreans. And this is my favorite part. So remember how I told you Lazar Kaganovich visited and he came to dinner and he praised the food. So the couple who served him, a husband and wife couple, were accused of trying to poison Lazar Kaganovich with gefilte fish, which is quite possibly the most Jewish charge ever made to anyone. But that was the charge that they tried to poison him with gefilte fish. So it's now the 30s. Stalin's great terror has reached Birabajan. And um, the, most of the people who were in charge are removed. And, new, and removed doesn't mean they just got fired. It means um, deported to Siberia at best, probably shot on sight at worst. Now, in 1940s, 1940, actually, Officials from Moscow come to Birabajan to see if this would be a good place to move the Polish Jews, because remember what happened in 1939. In 1939, you have Stalin and Hitler signing the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, non-aggression pact, where they agree they're not going to attack each other, but in exchange for not attacking each other, they're going to divide Poland nicely between themselves. So now they have all these Polish Jews trying to flee the German section, and they're coming into the Soviet Union, and the question is, well, maybe we should deport them to Birabajan. That would be a good place to keep them, but then they decide, nah, and send them to Siberia instead. So these are just some, some of the decisions that are being made about people's lives. So what we have here is we're heading into World War II because now by 1941, Germany invades the Soviet Union, actually starting with Ukraine, including the bombing of Odessa. And here's where things get kind of interesting and ironic in the sense that the Jews who went to Birabidjan, they lived in terrible conditions. As I said, holes in the ground or barracks. The work was backbreaking. They got very little equipment out there. So they had to do most of their harvesting by hand. Um, the um, the uh, food didn't really get out that far to them. So it was just what they could barely grow themselves. It was a very, very difficult life. But they sat out most of World War II. They were so far east that the Germans never got that far east. The Japanese never came in from their side. They were more conserved with China and Korea. So unless some of the people joined up, which they did, which in fact the character in My Mother's Secret, a novel of the Jewish Autonomous Region, does end up doing because his choice is either being arrested for all of those charges that I read and being um, either shot or deported to Siberia or join the Soviet army. So he joins the Soviet army and becomes part of the army that defends Moscow, which was completely brutal. Basically, there was no strategy to um, not letting the Germans into Moscow politically. It wasn't that important, but the decision was the capital couldn't fall. So they sent in people to defend Moscow. It was even called, it was called the meat grinder because people went in there, they barely lasted a few weeks before they were shot or killed. So that was completely brutal. But keep in mind that the Jews who were in Barabajan at the time sat out most of the war. Now, again, conditions were terrible. There was hardly any food. There was hardly any medicine. 
but they were not in the German occupied areas. For instance, Odessa was occupied by Romanians. Romanians were allies of the Nazis. So you had multiple instances of people being rounded up, killed either in the town square, killed on the um, in the outskirts. There were multiple massacres of Jews in Odessa and the Jews in Barabajan are relatively safe. Now, when World War II ends, there is a small attempt for Jews to return to Birabajan, especially those who had nowhere to return to. Basically, people who fled Odessa or other heavily Jewish cities returned after World War II to find the city destroyed. Many buildings were destroyed. There weren't places to live. So people were considering moving to Birabajan. And sort of the last bit of history that Barabajan makes is there was a rumor in the 1950s that Stalin, remember him, Stalin, that great friend of the Jews, was planning to deport all of the Jews of the Soviet Union. The rumors were that they were building barracks in Barabajan and that cattle cars were standing by to take people to Barabajan. Now, I was doing a talk a couple of weeks ago um, at a Jewish, uh, Russian speaking Jewish community center in the Washington DC area. And I was talking about the fact how these rumors, which have since been proven not to be true, are still important because it gives you a sense of how terrified people were at the time. The fact that people believed that such a thing was possible tells you about the state of mind of Jews in the Soviet Union in the late 1940s and early 50s. And this woman, she interrupted me, very incensed, to say that she knows for a fact that she knows someone who was actually a builder in Barabajan, and just because Stalin didn't write this down didn't mean that Stalin wasn't intending to do it. So she berated me for saying that it was a rumor when she knows this for a fact. Now, as we all know, games of telephone can go on. I know someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows someone. So I cannot tell you whether or not this is true or whether or not it's false, but I can definitely tell you that there are people who to this day believe that it's true which again tells you about the state of terror the Jews were living in in the USSR. And they believe that the only thing that stopped Stalin from deporting all the Jews of the Soviet Union to Barabajan was that he died in 1953. Um, actually, exactly when he died is unclear because he died. And then for 13 days, there was a big jostle for power. So nobody knows exactly when he died. But we know he died sometime in March of 1953. And there are people who believe that that's what stopped a mass deportation of Jews from all of the Soviet Union to Barabajan on the border of Russia and China. So people ask me, where is Barabajan now? Well, I mean, still physically there. And here's the very interesting part. It's still officially a Jewish autonomous region. That designation has never been removed. And the other thing is, Remember how I said I don't recommend releasing a book during a pandemic? Well, I was also researching this book, this next book, during a pandemic. So I couldn't go anywhere. I certainly couldn't travel to locations. So I was mostly doing research online. Um, Swarthmore University has some wonderful archives where they actually have posters and vintage photos. And as I mentioned, I found that movie on YouTube. I found other propaganda films on YouTube. And I found a documentary on YouTube about Barabajan, which is absolutely fascinating because you can see the, the documentary is from 2012. So it was from 10 years ago, but it was relatively modern. Is that officially it's still a Jewish autonomous region. So you can still see faded street signs in Yiddish and you can see thing names of buildings in Yiddish. And this is the most amazing part. So the area is heavily ethnic Korean right now. And you can see these adorable children in their local Russian school, and they're singing songs in Yiddish. These ethnic Korean kids are singing songs in Yiddish because they're learning about the history of their city. And so they're learning Yiddish songs. So technically, the area still exists. 
Now, people ask me when it comes to my book, both The Nesting Dolls and My Mother's Secret, a novel of the Jewish autonomous region, is how much of the book is, or the books are biographical. And my official answer is, you know how it says at the beginning, um, no characters or events are based on anyone living or dead? That's my story, and I'm sticking with it, officially. Unofficially, obviously, things are based on real people. Um, first of all, I used for reference a wonderful nonfiction book called Where the Jews Aren't by Masha Gessen. I think it's the sad and absurd story of Barabajan. And there's a lot of historical personages there, like Bergelsman and some other people, that I turned into more fictionalized version for my book. Also, the characters in my book are made up, but pieces of their lives are based on real people. And it's also based on just like anecdotes that I grew up hearing from my parents and my grandparents. For instance, to give you an idea, these are my grandparents, my mother's parents. So my mother's father, Shloma, grew up in a little shtetl outside of Odessa where people barely even spoke Russian. They really mostly spoke Yiddish because there was no reason for them to have to um, speak Russian. They didn't really deal with the general populace. And at 13 years old, 13 years old, I don't know if any of you have you know, children or grandchildren that age. My daughter, my youngest is 15. And this past summer, she went to the Maccabi Games in Israel. And so to my 15-year-old daughter, I kept saying, well, do you have your passport? Is your suitcase packed? Do you have your sports equipment? Do you know who you're supposed to meet? Do you know? She's 15. My grandfather, at 13 years old, left his little shtetl, moved alone to Odessa, lived in a boarding house, worked in a factory during the day, went to school at night, organized all of this himself at 13. And it was his father who wrote a letter to Joseph Stalin in Yiddish, thanking Stalin for the fact that his son, a Jewish boy from a nothing shtetl, had an opportunity to get an education under the Soviet Union. And it was this kind of attitude that permeates the book. It might not be based on someone who's real, but the attitude is there. My grandmother, on the other hand, who grew up in Odessa, who uh, was very proud of the fact that her children didn't speak Yiddish, because that showed how modern she was, how sophisticated she was, how cosmopolitan she was, before cosmopolitan became actually a slur in the Soviet Union for Jew. So it were those kind of attitudes that informed writing both The Nesting Dolls and My Mother's Secret, a novel of the Jewish autonomous region. So I try to teach history, but I also try to have a good story with characters um, who have um, inner lives and who can be funny. That's actually something else. I've gotten some feedback from people saying, well, this dialogue and the description seems really modern. And it really comes down to people believe that historical times people weren't funny, like people couldn't be sarcastic or people couldn't um, sort of have a sense of humor about themselves. I think people believe that in historical fiction, you should always be serious. Um, and they're surprised to find out that people in the past had sex because as you know, every generation has discovered sex. So the idea that old people who were once young people might have had sex in the past is not an idea that a lot of people are very comfortable with. So my characters have all of that because they're people. Because even though they lived in the 1930s, even though they lived almost 100 years ago, didn't mean they weren't people. So that's a big part of what I try to bring to my historical fiction is both humor and real people. And as I said, the bulk of the book takes place in the 1930s and the 1940s in the Soviet Union, but the modern section, the framing section is actually the 1980s in San Francisco, California, which is where I grew up. And it's also all about what happens to a relatively small American cities relative, you know, compared to New York, obviously, when it gets this huge influx of Russian speaking immigrants, and especially when they're not who people are expecting because this is very interesting. The free Soviet Jewry movement, I'm sure most of you remember in the 1970s, you know, Sharansky and the huge rallies that they had. In fact, in New York had one of the largest free Soviet Jewry movements in the United States. And there was all this battle to allow the Soviet Jews to immigrate, which finally happened in the 1970s. 
But then you get this major disconnect because most of the American Jews who were fighting for Soviet Jews were very liberal, very progressive, usually Democrats, sometimes even socialists or communists. And they were so excited to bring the Soviet Jews to the United States because they expected them to be just like them. And they are shocked when they get this influx of thousands of Soviet Jews who, guess what, are not communists, who are not socialists, who hate anything that sounds like it might be leading to socialism. So you have all this conflict between a community, the American Jewish community that worked so hard to bring these Soviet Jews to the US, and they're not at all what the American community expected. So I touch upon that a little bit as well in the modern section, which is the 1980s, which now I'm told is historical because the definition of historical fiction is something that happened 50 years prior to the date of the book's publication. And while the 1980s aren't exactly 50 years, they're getting awfully close. So it's sort of like, oh, my teenage years are historical fiction. That's interesting. Um, also in the book, uh, the characters go back to the Soviet Union because they're looking for some uh, people that they lost. And they went back in 1988, which is right after Gorbachev first comes to power, when he first announces perestroika, and when it was the first time that Soviet, formerly Soviet citizens, could go back to the USSR. Because that's another thing that I really like to stress, something that Americans tend to lose track of, in that most immigrants to the US, for instance, you have Irish immigrants who love to go back to Ireland and still consider themselves very strongly connected to Ireland, or you have Puerto Rican or Dominican immigrants who go back every summer, um, who visit their families, their ger even German Americans who feel a strong connection to Germany and go back to visit. On the other hand, when you left the Soviet Union in the 1970s, it was like a one-way trip to Mars. For all you knew, you were never ever coming back. And if you left behind, which so many people did, parents and siblings and other people, you were never seeing them again. So the fact that in 1988, for the first time you could go back was also very scary for people because they thought, oh yeah, we could go back, but are we gonna be allowed to leave again? That was a huge fear. My mother and I went back in 1988 and my grandparents were terrified because they thought that if we went back, we might never be allowed out again. So that's also something that I like to play with. And, and the final thing before um, I'll turn the floor over to questions because Margie told me we have a very hard out at two. And so I'm gonna stop talking shortly, don't worry, um, is that, I've my whole life in the US anyway, people would say to me, oh, you're Russian. And I would say, no, I just speak Russian, but I'm not Russian. They go, oh, right, 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 right. I'm sorry, you're from Ukraine. So you're Ukrainian. No, even though I was born in Odessa, Ukraine, even though my parents were born in Odessa, Ukraine, even though three out of my four grandparents were born in Odessa, Ukraine, we were never, ever, ever considered ethnically Ukrainian. Our internal passports said under the line nationality, not religion, not ethnicity, nationality, our Soviet portrait said nationality, Jewish. So while we lived in the Soviet Union, we were never considered Ukrainian, even though we were born and lived there. We were not considered Russian, even though we were Russian speakers. We were considered Jewish. Um, in fact, since the uh, the war began, uh, Mila Kunis, who is an actress, she was in the 70s shows and other things, there was this uh, headline which said, I am telling my children that they're half Ukrainian. And as my son said, that must be such a shock to her parents. They must be wondering who in the family is Ukrainian, because she certainly isn't, even though she was born, I think, in Chernovice in Ukraine. She immigrated roughly the same time I did at roughly the same age. Believe me, she never would have been considered Ukrainian while she lived there. But now I guess it's it makes for a convenient sound. Bite. So that is my presentation on the background behind my book. My Mother's Secret, a novel of the Jewish autonomous region, which as Margie so generally said, please 
go buy. It's on Amazon. It's on Barnes and Noble. It's in Target. It's at Books a Million. And it's available at your library. And if it's not available at your library, ask your library to order it because it is in the library system. Margie, I think I've hit every, every point there. So if people yeah. would like to um, ask some questions or would like to just share their own experience, I love hearing people's stories about their own families and where they're from. So I'm going to stop speaking for a bit and yeah. I would love to hear from you. So anybody can unmute themselves or raise your hand if you want to um, raise your hand and either ask a question, make a comment, or if there's nothing, then... <laughs> Otherwise, there's a danger that I'll just keep talking and nobody really wants that. Roberta, do you have something? I saw you unmuted yourself. I just wanted to say how appreciative I am that you are here and that you shared your story. I thought you did it extremely well in such an organized manner. And it's interesting that uh, Jews, wherever they are, are still Jews. It comes down to that. And if they don't know it, those around them will remind them. Yes, very much so. Thank, thank you so much for that. And, and thank you for your kind words. But yes, that is one of the points that I've been trying to make ever since I've been doing these talks is that it's really surprising to people to hear the Jews, no matter where they live, are never really considered to be the nationality of the country around them. Um, there, there's a Russian expression which says they don't punch your passport, they punch your face, which says that uh, even if your passport says something else, if your face says something different, then you're still going to be treated that way. Okay, we have somebody who's just come in. So, um, Helene, just FYI, the presentation is over. Um, we will have it on recording if you want to hear it later on. I any other any other questions or comments from people? I, I just want to say that uh, you really uh, gave a marvelous uh, presentation. And uh, I just started the book, actually. So I'm looking forward to reading the, the rest of it. And uh, do, by the way, uh, do you speak anywhere else? Can one uh, have you speak at an organization or a book club? Oh, absolutely. If you, I, I love doing book clubs. Um, my email is very simple. It's alinaadams at gmail.com. Couldn't be simpler than that. I'm even going to put it in the chat. Also, my website is alinaadams.com if you want to contact me through there. But um, yes, I speak to book clubs. I speak to sisterhoods, I speak to temple groups, and I love to do it. So please reach and, out. And who, and who just asked that question? It just says iPad 4, so we don't know who that is. Hello, what? the woman who just spoke? Hi, just what is your name? So we'll know your name. I'm sorry. Uh, let, let me put my video on. <laughs> no, okay. that's fine. We just need your name, that's all. Yeah. Bye. Okay. I just want Alina to know your name. Bertha Strauss. Oh, hi, Bertha. Nice okay. to meet you. And, 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 were, you here, were you here before speaking about your been, book? Yes, Helene, as I, Helene, I'm sorry. As I mentioned, the presentation is over. We recorded it, so you'll be able to listen to it. Um, but how, how do I listen to it? Well, just, you'll get a link. We'll talk about that later. I, I just want to tell you, I, I originally came from Germany and uh, I came here in 1946 after the war, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it's a good one. Sounds like it's a good story. Um. Um, also, I was going to say, if anyone who has the book, you know, if this was back in the past when I actually met people in person, I would have been happy to sign it for you. But since we're doing things right now, if you email me again at alinaadams at gmail.com, I can autograph a book plate for you and put it in the mail and mail it to you. And that way you can stick it in the book and you can pretend we had a human interaction, just like in the past. And just tell me um, your mailing address and who to send sign it to because sometimes people say will you sign it to my daughter will you sign it to my sister I'm happy to sign as many book plates as you like just tell me to whom and where to mail them to we're also going to have Alina come back and talk about her past writing romance novels and soap operas and uh, she's got a very interesting uh backstory I've so lived a lot of lives when will uh, be that meeting that you will come here again uh, we don't have that yet. It will go on the calendar, Helen. So we don't have it yet. Uh, anything else from anyone else? Roberta, do, do you have something else to say? 
I just found it fascinating. At one point at the beginning of your talk, you were talking about, um, you mentioned uh, that publishers would say they're not interested in the type of book that you're writing, but if you could write, what was it, like a romance kind of novel? Yeah, a Regency um, romance where I snuck Jews into Regency England. Right, and that that you have such talent that you're not limited to one type of writing and that you could branch out and and meet the needs of uh, publishers and, and the interests of, uh, of readers. I give you a lot of credit. Well, thank well, you. I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't realize that Bridgerton was written by someone who was Jewish. Yeah, Julia was Quinn really, actually is Jewish. Very interesting. Well, um, was, as a publisher, Margie, wouldn't you say publishers prefer to keep their authors in a box? Like you just yes, write yes. this, you just write that. They don't want to hear about your eclectic interests. No, they really don't. Unless you have a following in that electric, electric electric yeah. interest they're not so it's all what you can bring to the mix maybe we'll do a whole session on publishing because that would be fascinating <laughs> um anything from anybody else we do have a hard stop at two o'clock so um i don't want to make sure we get in anyone else's questions or comments okay going going it's so okay. Like I said, please reach out to me at Alina Adams and Gmail just to say hello. If you'd like a book plate, please give me your mailing address. I can add you to my mailing list to so you know what new things I have coming out. And if you'd like me to come to speak at your sisterhood or your book club, I'm always very happy to do that. And read her book and buy her book. Yes, thank you, Margaret. Either read, it, either read it from the library or buy it. You know, you can buy it in all kinds of formats now. You can buy it in just like Read yeah. it on your phone if you want to. So yeah. it's like you've got you all do. the options possible. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. And Alina will be back again. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.